Okay, so we have Dr. Gollum here. And wait, I can edit, by the way, I can edit anything out if you want me to, if you want to okay, backtrack on Great. Okay, good. Excellent. And I want to make sure I said your name right, Gollum. Yep, Gollum is fine. Okay, so we have Dr. Gollum here, and um, she's a medical doctor with uh, several interests and specialties, but I am interested in what her take is on mitochondrial disease. So Dr. Golan, please give us uh, background information and your specialty. My specialty is a little bit hard to characterize, but I uh, started out in physics, graduated at age 19 with a 4.0, had physics graduate fellowship offers to Harvard and Caltech, and then switched gears and did an MD-PhD with a PhD in biology, uh, additional training and research methodology as a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar, uh, after residency and chief residency in internal medicine, and then um, I spent uh, about 20 years, uh, you know, doing primary care medicine uh, while also doing research. And over time, my emphasis um, shifted uh, to problems and conditions and exposures and treatments with a tie to mitochondrial impairment and oxidative stress. Uh, we had been focused on risk benefit for a number of drug and environmental factors, and they all ended up uh, basically leading to mitochondria. So our work um, has included statin adverse effects, fluoroquinolone adverse effects, uh, and substantial work in Gulf War illness. So in 1990 to 1991, the U.S. deployed about 700,000 personnel to the Persian Gulf theater of operations, and about a third of them became chronically ill attributable to their deployment. That is to say, after you subtract the fraction of people who met similar symptom criteria among those who were not deployed, a full 30-ish percent of those that were deployed uh, in excess met these criteria. And uh, from, from relatively early, I noticed the parallel to uh, outcomes from other drugs where mitochondrial and oxidative toxicity had been implicated. And so I theorized that mitochondrial involvement might be a part of it. It was only considerably later that um, a lot of evidence came out that the toxins they were exposed to, and I should go back and mention, this is not a stress-related illness like PTSD. The ground war for the Gulf War only lasted four days, and many of them never saw combat. And yet this very high fraction of them came back chronically ill um, with symptoms like fatigue, muscle pain, muscle weakness, cognitive problems, gastrointestinal problems, respiratory problems, skin problems, uh, neurological problems. And over the ensuing 30 plus years, they have just not gotten better. In fact, many of them have continued to get worse. And they were young and healthy at the time, which is why they were selected for deployment. So that makes this particularly striking. And the, the factors that, that led me to hypothesize that there's a mitochondrial basis for this included the fact that they had a high multiplicity of symptoms spanning many different areas. So mitochondria are the energy powerhouses of cells, and cell, every cell in the body pretty much requires energy. Um, so mitochondrial problems are commonly, commonly involve multiple symptoms in many different domains, as they did in Gulf War veterans. And they varied from person to person. And this is also characteristic of mitochondrial problems. And that's in part because of a phenomenon in mitochondrial disease called heteroplasmy, which refers to the fact that organs start out with different mitochondrial vulnerability. And one reason for that is that you inherit your mitochondrial DNA only from your mother, unlike the rest of your Watson Crick nuclear DNA, which you inherit from both parents. And when your mom's egg divides, and the you know, six or so mitochondria segregate uh, into the daughter cells, some of those may have mutations that others do not, and those then become some organs and not other organs. So even for identical twins, uh, and even within a person, different organs may start with different mitochondrial vulnerability. And so the same exposure or problem, or even the same heritable mitochondrial disorder will manifest differently in different individuals. Um, and they also, it is also characteristic in the Gulf War, about 40% of the excess symptoms took more than a year to appear after the exposure. And that is also classic for mitochondrial impairment because um, this heteroplasmy is coupled with a, mito a mitochondrial phenomenon termed threshold effects, where 
the mitochondria, uh, the impaired mitochondria produce more oxidative stress, more oxygen free radicals. But they're also the main target. They're the main source and the main target of those oxygen free radicals because they and their DNA are right there where the free radicals are produced. And also, mitochondrial DNA have less effective repair mechanisms than the regular nuclear DNA. So, over time, this can produce a progressive problem. And it is only when the mitochondrial, the fraction of mitochondria impaired, or the severity of the mitochondrial impairment, or the number of cells that are lost as a result of that exceed a threshold that symptoms first become evident. And this is termed mitochondrial threshold effects. Um, and so that fit with the Gulf War illness profile with you know, a good number of the symptoms arising after the deployment, uh, you know, arising in excess after the deployment. And then also the focus of the symptoms, although many different domains were affected, there was a heavy emphasis on fatigue, brain, and muscle. And that's also classic for mitochondrial impairment. And that is because brain and muscle are highly energy demanding organs. And they're also quote, post mitotic, meaning they've done most of their dividing. So that once the damage is present, they're not just being replaced by new healthy cells in the same way that some other tissues may be. Um, and so the brain is about 2% of the body weight, but it uses about 20 to 25% of the oxygen of the whole body and 50% of the glucose. So it's especially energy demanding and muscle, particularly with activity is also very heavily energy demanding. And so that is why classically um, co brain symptoms, including, you know, cognition, sleep, mood, um, behavior are affected in mitochondrial uh, conditions and also muscle. So those are two heavily. So that was also a fit for the mitochondrial impairment. So the symptom profile with the high symptom multiplicity, the variability from person to person, the variable latency to symptom onset, um, and the, you know, the focus on these quote, post mitotic, unquote, energy, highly energy demanding organs, all pointed us toward mitochondrial impairment. And we've done multiple studies since then that have confirmed that. Um, including a recent muscle biopsy study that hopefully is about, we hope to be um, accepted. Uh, we just submitted the revised version back to the journal that, that shows a lot of interesting things. One is, is also the case that inflammation is increased um, in Gulf War veterans. And so I would say most groups except me have thought that inflammation was the cause of Gulf War illness. And that never made sense to me because I've seen a lot of patients with much higher levels of inflammation. And let me just say, when I say inflammation is elevated for most Gulf War veterans, uh, and I'm using Gulf War illness kind of as a proxy for the broader discussion about uh, mitochondrial problems and multi-symptom illness, because they were, I, I also should have mentioned, they were heavily exposed to many different new, unique, and excessive environmental chemicals. M and, and many chemicals, no matter what their nominal specific mechanism of action is, actually exert a lot of their toxicity through these twin intertwined mechanisms of oxidative stress and mitochondrial impairment. And so among other things, Gulf War veterans were exposed to organophosphates, um, both as pesticides and as sarin and cyclosarin nerve gas, especially when we demolished a munitions depot that had chemical weaponry and that was not known by the people who did the demolition, so they weren't protected. And then also there's a related class that are also, quote, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors called carbamates um, that also were used as pesticides and as a pyridostigmine bromide nerve agent pretreatment pill that we gave them. And they were, it was the first deployment where depleted uranium exposure occurred because we girded our tanks and our missiles um, with that for the purpose of making the missiles better able to penetrate other people's tanks and for preventing our tanks from being penetrated by other people's missiles. But during friendly fire episodes, um, that depleted uranium was aerosolized, and some people also got shrapnel. There was an unprecedented number of um, vaccines. The anthrax vaccine was used for the first time in military use on a wide scale and was not under close oversight for production at that time and did not undergo the normal um, uh, product release testing to ensure quality before release. Botulinum toxoid was used only for that deployment. Um, 
So there are many, many, many different exposures that occurred at high levels. They used permethrin impregnated uniforms, a different pesticide class. Um, so many, many environmental exposures. And then, you know, high fracture that became ill despite not having much combat exposure. And despite the fact that stress um, in any in any model of Gulf War illness that controls for other exposures, stress does not emerge as an independent predictor. It's a strong predictor of PTSD and people that had combat stress, some of them developed PTSD, but it is not a predictor of Gulf War illness, which is this condition defined by these multiple symptoms spanning many different domains. Um, uh, so anyway, so back to, so our, so inflammation didn't make sense to me because uh, although it's elevated compared to healthy controls, it's usually within normal limits, um, markers like C-reactive protein. And I've seen patients with much higher CRP levels that don't have this set of symptoms. And also, um, it, didn't, it wasn't the case that people reported that anti-inflammatory agents like Advil or whatever, uh, you know, resolved their symptoms. So it didn't really seem to make sense to me as um, an underlying mechanism, but it is elevated. And one hypothesis I've had for some time, and this may be way too, you know, I may be getting way too much in the weeds here, but <laughs> is that when there's oxidative stress, and again, impaired mitochondria cause oxidative stress, that triggers um, a phenomenon called programmed cell death, which goes by the fancy name of apoptosis. And apoptosis causes inflammation and also coagulation activation, which Gulf War veterans had. So I thought maybe it's the impaired mitochondria causing apoptosis that leads to the inflammation. So one of the things we did is we measured a muscle biopsy, mitochondrial function, and we also measured in blood C-reactive protein, uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein as a measure of inflammation. And then we asked, okay, are, you know, are, how does each of these relate to symptoms? Well, it turns out that the mitochondrial measures related strongly to symptoms. In fact, one of them that is a glucose-reliant mitochondrial measure uh, related with at least what's called borderline statistical significance, meaning less than one in 10 uh, probability that chance could be responsible. For 17 of the 20 symptoms in our Gulf War illness uh, severity score, which uses 20 symptoms that are each present at least 50% of affected Gulf War veterans, for 17 of those, that one mitochondrial index alone had at least borderline significance, again, meaning less than one in 10 probability that chance could be responsible. Whereas for inflammation, um, only one symptom bore a relationship. And in Gulf War veterans, one symptom bore a relationship only, but in the wrong direction, meaning higher inflammation was actually tied to less of the symptom. So inflammation did not relate to individual symptoms. Uh, in Gulf War illness, and it did not relate to overall symptom severity, which was very strongly tied to mitochondrial impairment. And for the couple of ones that didn't relate to that one mitochondrial measure, um, so, you know, glucose is particularly important for the brain. I mentioned it uses 50% of the total body glucose, and these glucose-reliant mitochondrial measures were especially strongly related to brain measures. Something called fatty acid oxidation is especially important for muscle and is the main source for muscle, especially at rest. And the fatty acid oxidation mitochondrial measures were more strongly related to the muscle measures. And then there was one symptom that's common in Gulf War veterans, which is like temperature dysregulation, feeling of like cold hands and feet. And that didn't relate to either of those measures, but it, but it is known that there's something called uncoupled mitochondrial resp uh, respiration, where oxygen use is not used to drive ATP production, but is used to drive thermogenesis, heat production. And that measure was related to this cold hands and feet thing that didn't seem to relate to the other mitochondrial measures. So it looked like there was, um, you know, the, the mitochondrial measures appeared lower in Gulf War veterans, but especially appears related to the, the degree of mitochondrial impairment related to the degree of each of these symptoms, whereas the inflammation did not. But then what was super interesting is it is known that impaired, quote, fatty acid oxidation specifically in mitochondria drives or is tied to increased risk of apoptosis. And in our study in the healthy controls, there was very little relationship between fatty acid oxidation and inflammation, which was clearly being driven by something else when it was present in the controls. 
that in the Gulf War veterans, um, the correlation was over 70 percent. So a correlation, um, you know, value can go from zero, which means there's no relation. They're randomly related to each other up to a maximum of one where there's a perfect relationship in the same direction or minus one where the, you know, the highest of one is related to the lowest of another. And here we're looking at, you know, higher mitochondrial function is related to lower symptoms or lower mitochondrial function related to higher symptoms. So we expect a minus sign. And the correlation coefficients were between minus 0.70 and minus point, I think it was like 77 to the different fatty acid oxidation indices. And this, this marker of inflammation specifically in Gulf War veterans, which is telling us that the fatty acid oxidation, as we had guessed, is driving um, the cell death, which is what's responsible for the inflammation. So the inflammation is not responsible for the symptoms. It does not relate to individual symptoms. And this helps explain why, um, you know, the, the levels of inflammation aren't radically high, and yet the symptoms are strong. And it also yeah. explains why anti-inflammatory drugs don't seem to be that helpful. Um, but we did a, a clinical trial of coenzyme Q10, which is a mitochondrial coenzyme that supports cell energy production and antioxidation. And that did significantly reduce symptoms and significantly improved objectively measured physical function compared to placebo in a double-blind clinical trial in single <clears throat> nice. So we, that was probably all way too technical, but yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. That's incredible. So let me ask a question though about the fatty acid synthesis. Um, are you you're talking yeah. about like you're talking about like the use of fats like ketones, for example, for the enhancement or the you know mitochondrial function to make ATP, as opposed to yeah. okay, great. Yeah, so, we we we're we're, we're yeah. so different energy sources can be used by the body. Right. Sugars are one source and fats are another source. So yeah. so fats are especially important for muscle tissue and uh, and fat generation of energy, when that is impaired, it is particularly tied to, uh, to apoptosis. And that is, and we saw that there was a very strong relationship between the degree of impairment and that, um, that ability to use fats for energy production uh, and increased inflammation, as we would expect if it were impaired fat driving cell death, driving inflammation. Yeah. So, so, the, so it looks like case, inflammation is a consequence of mitochondrial problems in Gulf War veterans. Um, uh, just like the symptoms are a consequence, but the inflammation does not seem to be a cause. Right. So the apoptosis, wouldn't that be um, a state where the body's, you know, trying to get rid of cells because they're toxic? It's a, it'd be a healthy thing in the, in the. Yes. So that of... is a very good point and very good point. And in fact, in the Gulf War veterans specifically, uh, if you control for the mitochondrial impairment, um, so the, the, the inflammation by itself was not a predictor of Gulf War symptoms, favorable or adverse. But if you controlled for the mitochondrial impairment, the mitochondrial impairment remained a strong predictor of greater Gulf War illness symptoms. And then the inflammation actually became a strong protective predictor. Um, so higher inflammation was tied to less Gulf War illness severity um, in the Gulf War veterans only, and only if you control for the mitochondrial problems. So you bring up a very good point. So apoptosis is, evolution drives the fact that we, you know, use this apoptosis to kill off cells. So if they're, for example, so dysfunctional that they're not contributing adequately, uh, perhaps because they're not making enough cell energy then it is in the body's interest to kill them off so they're not a drain on energy while they're not contributing. But this can cause its own problems, especially for organs like brain, where there's very little ability to replace cells once they're lost. And right. it's known, for example, in Gulf War veterans that there is increased brain atrophy. And also for muscle cells, they have some ability to replace them. There are what are called muscle satellite cells, which are like the stem cells for muscle but they have finite regenerative potential. Uh, so this is why when you have somebody who's 90, they can exercise all they want. They will never regain the muscle mass they had when they were younger because once you kill off those cells a given number of times, they can no longer replace themselves. So this is why you want to protect against 
that cell loss from occurring to begin with um, by things like, you know, mitochondrial and antioxidant supports that help the cells to be functional and not need to be killed off by the body. Right. So very good point on your part. Yeah. Thanks. So in the bigger picture though, of all chronic illness patients, you had mentioned yep. before earlier exposure versus heritable, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction. Yep. So what percent mm -hmm. is exposure versus heritable or inherited? Yeah, I, like I can't answer that question. Our focus is on conditions that are primarily exposure driven. Yeah. But it is also the case that even for primarily exposure driven conditions, we expect that genetics will influence the degree to which that exposure causes that problem. And the, that includes both nuclear genetics, like how well can you detoxify the chemical? And that's already been linked, for example, to Gulf Oilness. Again, Gulf Oilness is a great proxy for a lot of different things. It's a fantastic condition to study, not just to help the Gulf War veterans, but to help everybody else, which is why it's really sad that for the first time in many years, veterans were not successful in getting Congress to reallocate funding specific to Gulf War Oilness, because we've learned so much that is helpful to so many people. Um, but yeah, so detoxification genetics. So for example, um, that PB nerve agent pretreatment pill, people who took PB but have the usual genetics have about a 2.6-fold elevated risk of illness. Oh. But there are some rare variants of that enzyme that detoxifies PB, that butyl cholinesterase, that are very bad at detoxifying PB. People who have those rare enzymes but weren't exposed to PB are not more ill, which is perfect. It means they weren't predestined to become ill. But if they were exposed to PB, they have a 40-fold increased risk of illness. Wow. So that genetic predisposition radically amplifies the degree to which PB will be a problem, which is why whenever people say, oh, such and such a drug or chemical or an environmental exposure um, is safe, well, it may be safe in one person, but that doesn't make it equally safe in everybody. So also we now know um, that was worked by, by the way, by Lee Steele, whom, who's a dear friend and awesome researcher, and another longtime Gulf War illness researcher, Robert Haley at UT Southwestern, published a study recently showing something similar for the nerve gas exposure that the, um, and this is, it's harder to look at organophosphate detoxification because the gene involved in that, which is called peroxinase, there are different variants that are better at clearing different organophosphates, and Gulf War veterans were exposed to a lot of different organophosphates. But he looked at the variant that is bad at clearing like sarin nerve gas, and for people that were exposed to chemical alarms and also had the bad variant for clearing nerve gas, they also had elevated risk of illness. And now we're also super interested, so that's like phase one detoxification, like detoxifying the specific chemical, but right. after that is phase two detoxification, which is things like oxidative stress, you know, reduction. Yeah. And like a lot of people that are heavily chemically exposed, Gulf War veterans have higher rates of multiple chemical sensitivity. A lot of people try to believe that that problem doesn't exist. And in fact, I remember talking recently to an otherwise very smart environmental doctor who said, oh, he doesn't believe in it. It doesn't make sense because they report sensitivity to chemicals from widely different chemical classes. Yes, but chemicals from widely different chemical classes all exert part of their toxicity through mitochondrial impairment and oxidative stress, whether it's statins or every psychiatric medication or organophosphates and carbamates or uh, heavy metals or virtually every, uh, you know, I don't know, I, wanna, I don't want to say every, but, but, you know, many or most drugs and chemicals exert a good part of their toxicity through that mechanism. And so organophosphates, just as an example, and I'm going to kind of lose my way, so help me back to the place that I started from, okay. uh, which was detoxification and genetics and how it's like it's not just environment, it's not just genetics, it's how they interact together. And I want to say something about multiple chemical sensitivity phase two genetics. Um, but, uh, okay, now I lost my way. So you're talking about <laughs> forward genetic factors regarding detoxification phase one, phase two, well, that one I can remember getting back to. Now I lost, I lost my detour. Um, so, I, but let me, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll get back to the original point then. Okay. Um, 
so the original point was there's, you know, different, so Gulf War veterans had high, oh yeah, so multiple chemical sensitivity, people didn't believe in it because th okay. these are widely, you know, different drugs and chemicals. But the example I was going to give is for organophosphates, which are these nasty, nasty pesticides that are tied to illness in a lot of people and also used as a nerve gas, right, um, which is clearly bad. And there, it is known that they are, quote, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. So acetylcholine is that nerve chemical that is involved in Alzheimer's, so it's important for memory. It's also the nerve signaling chemical that's used in muscle. Um, it's involved in sleep and a lot of other things. So, so acetylcholine is a very important nerve signaling chemical, and, and acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme, a, 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 a protein that, that, does a, that does a job in the body that is involved in, in uh, sort of breaking down acetylcholine. So like if your brain cell releases acetylcholine, it's for the purpose of conveying a message. And once that message is conveyed, you don't want that signal to continue to be released. The example I give is if you have a black and white TV uh, and every one of the lights is on, that conveys no information. It's the pattern of the light and dark that conveys the messaging. So you don't want the light to stay on after it's done conveying that part of the message, whether it's on a black and white TV or in the brain. So this acetylcholinesterase, you know, clears that acetylcholine after it's done with its job, and that's important for many reasons. And acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are these drugs that are used as insecticides and nerve gases and so forth that block that breakdown. So they lead to excess acetylcholine signaling. So everybody focuses in the past on, gee, it's this excess acetylcholine signaling that's responsible for toxicity. And it does contribute to acute toxicity, but the fact that chronic problems are, prime, you know, are, are substantially oxidative and mitochondrial is proven by animal studies that show that if you give high quality antioxidants either just before or just after exposure, you protect against lethality from organophosphates and also protect against chronic health consequences. So the acetylcholinesterase and the excess acetylcholine activity, you know, may be relevant, but even though that the the, the nominal specific mechanism of action of the drug is that acetylcholinesterase inhibition, in fact, a lot, you know, a lot of the toxicity, if not most of the toxicity that we care about is from this mitochondrial oxidative mechanism. And that's true for many, many, many drugs and chemicals. So multiple chemical sensitivity actually makes a lot of sense uh, because when people have impairment in these detoxification systems uh, for oxidative stress, that affects the toxicity of many drugs and chemicals. And in fact, there's data showing that people with multiple chemical sensitivity and also people with electrosensitivity, that people that have impaired gene variants of these antioxidant defense systems have significantly elevated rates of those problems. And we found the same thing in Gulf War veterans. So SOD2, superoxide dismutase 2, is the main antioxidant inside the mitochondria. Uh, and there was a study in Japan that found that people that have this bad variant of SOD2 that's less good at, at quenching the, that, those free radicals and protecting from injury, that was significantly tied to multiple chemical sensitivity in Japanese. And we found the same thing in our Gulf War veteran sample, that that same that impaired variant of SOD2, and I shouldn't really say impaired, that variant that in this case is, is not good, <laughs> was that people that had that were significantly more likely to have uh, multiple chemical sensitivity among the Gulf War veterans as well. So again, these mechanisms of oxidative stress and mitochondrial impairment are so important for so many chronic illnesses, including these multiple symptom things that people often go into doctors and doctors say it's all in your head or it's, psycho you know, it's psychosomatic, it's conversion disorder. Um, but no, I mean, it involves these mechanisms that doctors are just not trained in and that there aren't easily accessible tests to assess for. So, so doctors aren't trained in them and they, and they tend not to believe in them. And there's also kind of probably because, you know, a lot of medical education is pharmaceutical industry funded. So they're, they're, and a lot of the, you know, the professors that, that study drug, et cetera, activity get funding from drug companies. And so they're, 
has sort of becomes a shift in attitude that basically, you know, uh, favors drug benefits and is uncomfortable with the possibility of drug and chemical harms. And so that's a problem that we have in allopathic medicine that is not equally present um, in a lot of the alternative medicine disciplines that are not equally, you know, sort of intertwined um, with with operations that make profit. And we're all the same. Everybody responds to incentive systems and profit. It just so happens that there are thankfully groups that don't have that same particular profit um, relationship that are still sort of available to take these patients seriously. And I will say that we've done surveys and asked about, you know, how receptive was your doctor to your problems? Uh, and we ask separately for allopathic and, and uh, alternative practitioners. And, and I'll, I hate to say it, but us traditional doctors are much worse at taking these kinds of problems seriously the chronic than, illness, yeah, than, the, than alternative yeah. practitioners. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we were going back to, so oxidative stress, mitochondrial toxicity, important for a lot of different problems. So I was talking about multiple symptoms, but there are a lot of other things, metabolic syndrome, factors like hypertension, diabetes, um, uh, you know, dyslipidemia, weight gain are also tied to mitochondrial impairment and other forms of cell energy impairment, uh, which is kind of the opposite of what most people think. They think, oh, too much energy in, more, you know, more weight gain, more problems. But really, it's where there are episodes of inadequate cell energy, the body puts into place these mechanisms to try to offset that by increasing blood pressure to make sure that oxygen is being delivered where it might not otherwise, by increasing blood sugar as a step, as an energy, you know, source adaptation, by increasing triglycerides, which are a fat source of energy, um, by, you know, increasing hunger so people will pack on more fat. But even if you don't eat more, by, by altering uh, gene expression to enhance lipodeposition, meaning fat deposition in the body. So we'll hear from people who are on a drug that causes mitochondrial toxicity that whenever I'm on it, I'm hungry all the time, that even if I don't eat more, even if I manage to restrain myself from eating more, I still gain weight and I go off the drug and the weight melts away. Um, so it drives metabolic syndrome and then metabolic syndrome, you know, has been tied to virtually every problem known to man. And that's really because oxidative stress and cell energy impairment are tied to virtually every condition known to man. It's not necessarily that the metabolic syndrome is responsible. It's a marker for the fact that there are these other processes going on, this impaired cell energy and oxidative stress that in turn contribute to everything from depression to cancer to um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so uh, are you a fan then of getting people into ketosis to try to enhance mitochondrial function? And I think ketosis is also like the foundation of detoxification too. What do you think about that? I'm just going to say, I, I don't have a comment on that. I don't really know enough about it to, to okay. have a comment one way or another. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will say that, you know, clearly a dietary profile that is lower in simple carbohydrates and higher in fats and proteins is more healthy metabolically. And there's abundant data that show that. And, you know, among the other, you know, I, I tell people that if you're going to eat simple carbohydrates, you want to accompany it or even precede it by fat and protein, because fat will blunt the blood sugar rise that, that actually is the problem. It's not, I mean, excuse me, that is, that is not itself the problem, but leads to release of insulin that leads the blood sugar to plunge. And that is the problem. It is when that insulin release occurs and the blood sugar drops that cells feel threatened and they say, oh, I better become resistant to the effects of insulin. Um, and so that's what drives insulin resistance. So if you have fat first, it blunts that blood sugar rise. And if you have glucagon from the protein, that that offsets the effects of insulin in causing um, the blood sugar to fall. So um, that's why, like, it's not the high glucose <laughs> that is the problem. It's the fact that it leads to this low, well, I mean, the high glucose can also be a problem because high glucose 
interacts with oxidative stress to cause nasty things called glycation end products. Mm-hmm. But this, but the, but the sort of the the progressive development of insulin um, resistance comes from the fact that the blood sugar rise is is a precursor to a plunging level of blood sugar arising from the release of insulin. And that's why the body says, ooh, I better not have low sugar like this again. I better become resistant to the effects of insulin. And insulin resistance is essentially, you know, what drives diabetes. So uh, so definitely dietary profiles that uh, don't focus on simple carbohydrates um, and that at least, you know, if you have them, accompany them with fat and protein are are clearly better for people. Um, but yeah. Right. So I'm happy that you brought up glucagon. So like listening to, uh, I'm going to say social media doctors, you know, legitimate and, and, you know, and just let me tell you that I don't know any of them or what they say. So sure. I, I, I may not be in a position to answer your questions and I'm not up on all kind of the, the current, like, you know, social media thinking about. Well, it's totally fine because you brought up glucagon, which hardly anybody brings up, you know, like it's, everybody's all focused on insulin, but you know, it's part of the picture and there's, everybody's like an insulin sort of expert, but I'd like to Mm -hmm. see people who are glucagon experts and it's the same story. It's just a different perspective of, you know, our body should be like running on glucagon primarily and insulins for more like emergencies etc you know insulin all that stuff so let me change the subject then to the next um so you mentioned multiple chemical sensitivity um reactive oxygen species of course the organophosphates uranium all the environmental toxins okay so basically it comes down to toxicity and you mentioned Mm -hmm. coq10 but do you have any other uh viewpoints of other therapies like detox products binders that kind of stuff that you use or that you studied well, so the problem with studies is you have to have preliminary data and then you have to apply and then you're competing against a lot of other people for funding and they have to have an interest in it. And again, that's why we were super lucky that for some time there was dedicated funding for Goal 4 Illness uh, because there's often not a lot of interest in in these kinds of areas. Um, in traditional medicine, we did do a small and just finished seeing the last participant in a mitochondrial cocktail study that sort of expands beyond coenzyme Q10 to include um, other things that support mitochondrial function like carnitine and alpha-lipoic acid and B vitamins and uh, vitamin C and vitamin E to see if that will enhance the benefit. It's just a pilot study, so it's not designed to have enough people in it to necessarily produce significance. And we don't know what we will find when we analyze it because we're just entering date, doing date entry now. But we do know that there are some people that found it sufficiently beneficial that they asked if they can have the contact information for the compounding pharmacy um, and the information about the supplement uh, because several of the, the small number, really, they wanted to pay out of pocket to continue that treatment. So at least for some people, it seems like that, um, you know, conferred a material benefit. And there are absolutely other things that kind of operate through, um, you know, supporting the uh, mitochondrial function and antioxidation that are promising. There are some tiny studies that um, have some fine flaws, but, you know, are still promising that, um, that look at things like, you know, resveratrol and curcumin. I think the investigators initially thought of these as anti-inflammatories, but if you're getting rid of inflammation by supporting mitochondrial function and protecting its apoptosis, then we expect that that will be favorable. And the preliminary data looked favorable. And both of those things support mitochondrial function. Right. And you're talking um, clinical trials, yeah. right? Not like lab or mice. You're talking people clinical trials? Yeah. These are clinical trials in people. Nice. Small numbers. Okay. Of, yeah, modest numbers, I think. They had like really small groups in that study, like 10 per, per group. Um, but still, it showed apparently you know, benefit. Um, uh, And then there are other things that I will mention. So, you know, one thing that I think is really highly underappreciated is the importance of of oxygen. So I mentioned, you know, oxygen is a 13-fold multiplier in how much um, ATP people make per glucose molecule. 
the 15 fold multiplier, but then two are taken away. So it's a 13 fold multiplier. And so it's really, really important. And when people have impaired mitochondria, they can't afford to have any decrements in that oxygen because they need, you know, all the energy they can get. And so when people are recumbent, when they lie down at night, there's a tendency in many people for the upper airway to relatively collapse. And when people have mitochondrial impairment, that weakens muscle. And so those upper airway dilator muscles that hold open the airway are weaker. And so these populations have very high rates of pulmonary sleep disorders that may or may not, which is like another word for basically for like sleep apnea, that may or may not meet clinical definitions for sleep apnea. So where there are episodes during the night of oxygen falling, and that then leads to further inadequate cell energy, and that then further weakens muscle and um, contributes to cognitive problems and muscle problems and pain and everything else. And, uh, and fatigue. And so that is a remediable um, um, element of many of these problems that often produces uh, the biggest benefit or one of the biggest benefits to people is just correcting those episodes of inadequate fall oxygen. We did a small pilot study in veterans with goal for illness without you know, formally testing for sleep apnea, but just putting them on uh, kernel low dose oxygen at night um, CPAP, which is normally used for sleep apnea, is very is often very poorly tolerated, and the non-compliance rate is like 65% right. um, in some studies. So, um, but but nocturnal oxygen just by nasal cannula using a machine called an oxygen concentrator that just you plug into the wall and it takes the air and concentrates the oxygen. And you, it, it's important that it's low dose oxygen um, uh, will alleviate you know, by nasal cannula is very well tolerated. And you'd think, gee, you're adding oxygen, you should get more oxidative stress. But it is known that correcting reductions in oxygen will actually lessen oxidative stress. So sleep apnea has episodes of lower oxygen. Those episodes are tied to increased oxidative stress. And treatment to correct that is tied to lower oxidative stress. So Essentially, what you know, you're you're aiming for the optimum where you're not the oxygen is not too high or too low. High oxygen definitely very toxic, and oxygen is treated like almost more restrictively than narcotics in the medical community. I think because really of a lack of understanding. Uh, um, but you know, so Gulf, you know, in this tiny number of Gulf War veterans that we included in this pilot study, they had improvement in uh, muscle function and pain and and cognitive function. Um, and then also, you know, as, <laughs> as a side note, the wife of one of them said, oh, gee, he used to snore and at three weeks on the oxygen, his snoring stopped. And at three weeks after we stopped it, the, the snoring came back. And that goes back to what I said, which is that the airway dilator muscles themselves become weakened by the inadequate cell energy. And that then contributes in a bit of a vicious cycle to worsened, uh, you know, energy and then worsened muscle function. And so after a while of those cells having more adequate cell energy, that strengthens those muscles again enough that this guy's snoring went away. And there's data showing that that airway, that bigger, better airway opening with treatment of sleep apnea translates to the daytime as well. So people have a wider caliber airway even during the day, if they're getting adequate cell oxygen at night. And again, that makes sense because you have these airway dilator muscles that are needed to hold open the upper airway. So yeah. I think that's like an element um, that, as far as I know, I'm the only one that focuses on <laughs> uh, this, this phenomenon where muscle weakness affects the upper airway dilator uh, muscles, which then in turn promotes uh, episodes of inadequate oxygen at night Again, those muscles tend to be, you know, uh, subject to relative collapse in the recumbent position, yeah. um, and and correcting that for a lot of people can can lead to a lot of benefit. Um, in terms excellent. of, um, I was going to say that's excellent. So there's a lot of attention on increasing oxygen in social media. I study um, the founders of healthcare, founders of medicine back in the 1920s and 30s. And even back then, they knew that there was really two factors. One is a decrease in oxygen in relation to um, increase in toxicity. 
And so at the time they called it lactic acidosis, which now has a different definition, but you know, 95 years yeah, ago. Yeah, so basically what they're saying is there's impaired mitochondrial function. And, exactly. and other. And let me just say, it's not just mitochondrial impairment. I mean, when you have oxidative stress, that causes, quote, endothelial dysfunction. So the blood vessels themselves, you know, that would normally uh, open in response to increased need can respond to the same signals to relatively shut down. So blood flow itself is also impaired. And there are a range of factors that I won't go into the details of, but that also can increase um, uh, urination and lead to volume depletion. So a lot of people with chronic fatigue have lower total blood volume. And then even if it measures that their red blood cell, the fraction of the blood that has, you know, red blood cell number is adequate. And each of the red blood cells has the right amount of oxygen in it. If there's decreased total in blood volume, you're having much less oxygen, glucose, et cetera, delivery. And right. also, it means those small capillaries, there's not enough blood to keep them around. And so they get resorbed by the body. And there's data showing, for example, in fibromyalgia that there's reduced capillarity in muscle. So they have fewer capillaries. And there's data in chronic fatigue showing that, that a good number of them have reduced total blood volume. And, and I know exactly what the mechanisms are that drive those. But I won't go into that here. That cell energy impairment itself then drives cell energy impairment by driving diuresis and natriuresis yeah, um, the that then the further compounds that problem. Yeah, interesting. Let me ask then about electromagnetic sensitivity and you mm -hmm. know radio frequency sensitivity. So if you have mm -hmm. mitochondrial dysfunction caused by all these toxins, et cetera, does it make that sensitivity worse? It makes it more likely to happen and there's a very strong overlap between multiple chemical sensitivity and electrosensitivity. The majority of electrosensitive patients, but not all, have multiple chemical sensitivity. It's probably the minority of multiple chemical sensitivity, sensitivity patients that have electrosensitivity, but it is mostly that group that develops it. It often comes after a major electromagnetic exposure, or uh, but it also has risk factors from chemical exposures. And so, for example, we did a survey study of people with electrosensitivity, and we were interested in, like, you know, these mitochondrial and oxidative precursor factors and what are risk factors. And there are some risk factors that you might expect. There was a very high fraction of people who reported mold sensitivity, chronic Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, um, obviously, multiple chem chemical sensitivity, especially strongly related. Um, also, uh, oxidative stress, another of the things it does is it drives autoimmunity, which is also, you know, many different autoantibodies are elevated in veterans with gulf illness. They also are el elevated with virtually every other mitochondrial toxin um, exposure problem. So oxidative stress, um, uh, you know, there's a zillion papers showing that it, it, it it promotes autoimmunity. It modifies, quote, epitopes in a way that makes them more vulnerable to autoimmune attack. It also drives apoptosis, which exposes cell contents to the immune system, which also contributes to driving autoimmunity. Um, and that was, again, like one of my tangents that I sometimes have a trouble finding my way back from. Um, and you were asking about uh, like electromagnetic like electrosensitivity and uh, multiple chemical sensitivity. And so electrosensitivity also, uh, we asked about, you know, personal history of autoimmune disease and family history of autoimmune disease. And both of those were significantly increased in, the, in people with electrosensitivity, which tells us that, that part of electrosensitivity and the reason why some people can have infinitesimal exposure and have really outsized uh, responses is autoimmune. And in, in fact, there's a study by a French researcher named Belpom that showed that 23% of people with electrosensitivity have autoantibodies to O-myelin. So myelin is a thing that covers, like I think most people know this by now, nerve cells that allows fidelity and timing of um, nerve transmission. And that's what's disrupted through antibodies and multiple sclerosis. But actually there's data, for example, in Gulf War veterans that many, many, many different CNS, meaning central nervous system, i.e. brain, autoantibodies, and also there's data showing that peripheral autoantibodies that are also increasing goal for veterans, and we think the same will be found in electrosensitivity once that is studied. And we also were in communication with people who had very major exposures um, to electro, you know, 
electromagnetic radiation cell tower, major cell tower put up right by their home where every, like, you know, both the members of a couple ended up getting autoimmune disease in one case, like triggered, like right after a major upgrade on the cell tower that led to multiple strokes in one individual. Oh um, so, so autoimmunity is a, is a feature of this. Things that are known to be tied to mitochondrial impairment and oxidative stress, like the conditions I just mentioned, are risk factors. So is past um, use of fluoroquinolone antibiotics, uh, which was reported more in the people who became electrosensitive. Those can be significant mitochondrial and oxidative toxins. And the fraction of those who reported having taken a fluoroquinolone who had had adverse effects to them in the electrosensitive group was 50% compared wow. to, I think, something like 5% in the control group. So that also tells you that they also had pre-existing vulnerability to that mitochondrial toxicity. And then one of the really interesting things we did was we thought, okay, well, it looks like electromag for a lot of people, there's a stepped progression of this condition Well, where they'll have a significant electromagnetic exposure and that will drive their first clinical electrosensitivity, and then maybe later they'll have another one, and that will make it worse, and that will make them more sensitive, and then maybe another one, another one. So we thought, do these people, are they more likely to have had previous electromagnetic radiation exposures before they became electrosensitive that helped step them up toward the point where they hit that threshold of clinical symptoms, and how would they know? And so the question we asked was, have you had a significant electromagnetic shock, like a significant electric shock. And 25% of the electrosensitive uh, people compared to 5% of controls had done so. And these were not minor events. Two reported having been struck by lightning. And by the way, we heard from two other people later who had been struck by lightning, uh, you know, near fatal DC work accident, you know, as a child grabbed a an unshielded refrigerator wire and you know, basically my hand went into tetany and I was unable to release until they unplugged it. So people had reported often major electro, you know, electric shock exposures that seem to have kind of set them up to be more vulnerable. Wow. So there's this mantra promoted by industry that only ionizing radiation can cause problems. So what is ionizing radiation? So first, what is electromagnetic radiation? And, the, you know, radiation people know about is light and they know about, you know, radiation like in atom bombs, and they know about ultraviolet light from the sun and maybe infrared light like from infrared saunas. So essentially, you know, radiation are these waves that are also like particles like photons that um, travel in, in, you know, uh, at the speed of light, no matter what their quote frequency is, whether, whether it's light frequencies or other frequencies, they all travel at the same speed, the speed of light. But they have a different number of waves that pass this, you know, a point per second, um, and that's the frequency. And so the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. And if the energy is high enough, then that energy can be sufficient to dislodge an electron from an atom or molecule, and that's called ionization. And so ionizing radiation is from part of the ultraviolet spectrum um, on up to higher frequencies like X-rays and gamma rays. And the rest of it is non-ionizing. So uh, light is non-ionizing, infrared is non-ionizing, radio frequencies are non-ionizing. And so the mantra is that only ionizing radiation can cause problems. Well, what about your microwave oven? Okay, well, okay, it can cause problems, but only by heating. But in fact, there's abundant evidence that for both ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation, much or most of the toxicity, again, is through mitochondrial impairment and oxidative stress. Uh, and so it, it may be ionizing, but a lot of the problems are from oxidative stress, which is also produced by non-ionizing radiation. And there's some data showing in mitochondrial involvement, and I, I predict that that will turn out to be like, the, like po possibly the major key here, uh, but certainly a very strongly intertwined element. Wow. Um, there's a reason why these people are strongly intertwined with chemical sensitivity, because the same phenomena of mitochondrial impairment and oxidative stress are involved and common impairments in defense against them are involved. And also, if you have more free radicals being produced by your impaired mitochondria, you're going to be more vulnerable to both because you're perched closer to that threshold where your antioxidant defenses are inadequate to 
protect you with the next oxidative stressor exposure, whether it's electromagnetic or whether it is chemical. Um, right. so that was kind of a long-winded, not even sure it was an answer to your question. No, it was fantastic. Of no, it was really, really good. So when smart meters were rolled out, what was it, nine years ago, I became, um, I did a video on my YouTube channel that a lot of people saw. So I started getting people in my office who were EMF and RF sensitive. And when I started digging around in their health um, scenario, if you will, there was a few people that had really bad mold cases in their house. And um, yeah. there's, a doc, there's a guy named Dr. Dietrich Klinghart, and he said that mold will um, reproduce at a rate 600 times no normal in the presence of radio frequencies. So that's when I realized, okay, EMF sensitivity is a thing, but there's also more stuff behind it that people aren't really talking about. So it's, you know, in the evolution of my education training and clinical experience, it, it's, you know, always comes back to the mitochondrial function. What was your, real quick, what was your, um, when you studied physics, did you have like a specialty or strong interest in, in, uh, no, I just mentioned I was I only studied physics as an undergraduate, so I never really did specialization. Okay. I did work allegedly for two summers at Jet Propulsion Laboratory as an okay. engineer. Um, right. But but yeah, the, I never yeah went on in physics. Cool. I I only took one class. I took a theoretical physics class in undergrad, and I aced it. Like I loved it. It was it came so easy to me. And anyway, so I've always been into physics myself too. Um, all right, look, so it's been like a, what's well, been like an hour or something. Yeah, exactly an hour. So I think this is good for uh, the video. It, you covered like all these fantastic uh, subjects. I'm going to go through the video and, and make some chapters so people can go through the timeline and click on the things that they're interested in or maybe pertain to them more than anything else. So I really don't have any other questions. Like you did such a great job of of um, covering all this material in good detail. So I really appreciate it. Okay, well, uh, th yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, take care, Dr. Beatrice. Okay, and we'll take care, bye-bye. Okay, all right, bye.